they abandon their belief in the supernatural. Now, you are asking me to sabotage that achievement, to send them back into the dark ages of superstition and ignorance and fear? No! Welcome to another edition of Tool. It's been a while since we've been back doing the regular shows, but we're back here. And with me tonight, introducing a long-time co-host, Kitch. How's it going? I'm fantastic, thank you. And our newbie, I think you're on your oh your third show now, so you're now permanent property of Toolzilla. <laughs> yeah, hey, how's it going? One of us, one of us. <laughs> one of us. <laughs> So, as always, this is the news section coming up, and later on in the show, we have segments from Lundy doing his philosophy bits. We have Viking skepticism with Marty, and Zillard, you've got a segment coming up as well. Yeah, more going into geometry, its importance, and pitfalls that we have to stay out of. Yeah, and also coming up, you don't want to miss it, we have our interview with Phil Moriarty from 60 Symbols. Kitch, I think our listeners should be kind of quite familiar with him already. Oh yeah, they, he's been on the charity show, that's his most recent appearance, and he was on the show last year, actually. This time last year, if I remember correct. Yeah, and around this time last year, we had him on. Yeah, we're going to be talking to him about science in the media, Mr. Porter, because I know that's a subject he's very, very passionate about. But anyway, we shall get straight into the news, and I think the one big news story we've got to comment on this week is Rosetta, and I think I'll go to Zilla for your opinions on the whole Rosetta mission at the moment? Yeah, well, it's been a, a great success story despite some of its uh, problems yeah. for astrophysics at the moment. I've not heard a lot of what's happened with the, the attempt at the drilling. I know that it, the lander has powered down now. Yeah. So we're going to have to wait to find out if anything came of the drilling and hammering. But it's been sniffing away at what, well, what material comes off this comet? So we're going to get a good idea of what it's made of and, you know, help give us better models of where some of the material in the solar system came from and how it brought that material to Earth or helped form the Earth. But inevitably, there's been the ufologists and crackpot conspiracy theorists having a field day. Well, if you don't mind, we'll all just give our comments. So, I mean... It is a fantastic achievement, this, and probably just with the three of us, we're a bit biased, but it's an astounding achievement for the European Space Agency in particular. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because I think it's fairly obvious they don't have anywhere near the amount of money thrown at them that NASA or the Russians do. So, I mean, they're really doing this on a shoestring budget, and what they've done is, uh, someone pointed out that, you know, when they did this, this launched 10 years ago, when podcasting itself was in its infancy, there was no Facebook, there was no Twitter, there was no YouTube either. So, I mean, that puts it all into a bit of perspective. Yeah, just to get an idea of the difference in funding that this body has compared to NASA, just look at their main control room yeah. compared to, you know, NASA's ones at places like Houston. And it, it just looks like a little hired out warehouse. <laughs> it's almost like a porter cabin. You know? Yeah. So it's incredible that they've managed to do it, like you say, on such a small budget. It's such a monumentous achievement to get this done, despite some of its problems with the anchoring. Uh, hopefully that could be sorted out, but it's a tremendous achievement for ESA, and I'm just really excited to see what happens, what, what, what we're going to find out. It's one thing that always gets me with these missions, people focus on the problems they had with it. But it's when you actually look at it, it's more amazing that they actually made it to the comet itself because traveling in space is horrendously unpredictable and very dangerous. There's just so much open a chance. So the fact that we can actually get anything to another planet is an achievement, or a comet even, is just an achievement on its own. Well, yeah, one of the guys at NASA, I think, said that um, the the lander part of the mission, getting the lander from the the Rosetta probe down to the comet was the equivalent of jumping off a bus at around 40,000 miles per hour onto another bus traveling at 40,000 miles per hour. Yeah. 
that's an incredible achievement in itself. Yeah, it really is. I mean, just hats off to the guys that have managed this. But with that, as always with any kind of science story that we've noticed anyway, is that not soon after it, the conspiracy theorists latch onto it. And that's your story for this week, Zilla. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, quite funny to watch. I think the website UFO Sightings Daily (laughs) has an email that they say they've got hold of given by somebody who won't disclose their name, who says they work within ESSA. They say they they won't disclose their rank within ESSA either, which immediately rings alarm bells because it's not a military organization. There are no ranks. And the email basically says nothing at all. It just continually says it's not a comet. It throws up the idea that it's ridiculous that people would spend this amount of money just to go and fly to any old comet in the solar system. Yeah. As if there's no scientific value to this mission whatsoever. And they basically seem to think that it's a UFO, that there are obviously manufactured things on the surface of it. And they've supplied a couple of very blurry images, one which suggests there's a UFO flying on top of it, which just looks like a blurry little circle. (laughs) And that this is what they're basing it on. And now since ESSA brought out the recordings that they found of the the magnetic field of the the comet interacting with the solar wind, which is a wonderful bit of recording, they've now suggested that this is a communication signal that this UFO is sending out. And they they seem to forget that we've only just heard this for the first time. And they're saying that we heard this several years ago before this mission was even thought of. There were radio signals being blasted from outside the solar system and we heard them and that's why we're doing this this mission. I've seen a lot of these recordings online and they're not actually radio signals. What they're doing is they're translating things like magnetic waves into audible frequencies, if I remember correctly. Is that what... Yeah, they're basically taking these frequencies, speeding them up to around about 10,000 times yeah. speed so that we can hear them in our in our own audio um, range. Now, just to say, you can go online and you can look up uh, sounds of Saturn, even sounds of Earth. They've done this to the Earth, they pointed... They picked up all the magnetic waves coming out of Earth. And like it's quite spooky, but it doesn't really mean anything to our, our ears, kind of thing. Yeah, and it, it wouldn't mean anything to anyone's ears, you know, not even to an alien's ears. This is just the random interactions of yeah, the solar wind with the magnetic field. Yeah. So Yeah, it means as much as kind of probably listening to your computer fan does. Yeah. It makes as much sense to say that this comet is broadcasting these radio signals as it does to say that the moon shines its own light upon the surface of the Earth. You know, at best, this is just interactions with solar wind. So it's like the moon reflecting sunlight. There's nothing being broadcast here. That is just fantastically stupid. I just don't know what much to add because, because, you know, astrophysics is not really my area of expertise but yeah but you know this is well Kitchen, you've noticed that it's a general trend for pseudoscientists they come along after the hard work's been done and try and attach themselves to it uh, that's because it's easy to do that yeah. you know we've seen this well recently on one of our videos we've had this discussion with a guy called mr intelligent design and he's doing the exact same He's taken all these scientific discoveries and just said, ah, design, there you go. And I've made up a new theory that totally demolishes science. Yeah, and you have to pay to see it, by the way. You have yeah. to pay to see his experiments. So I was like, no. Well, we won't get into that. But like, I mean, you've seen this like with Ebola, there's homeopaths and all that. They've come along after proclaiming they knew about this. Oh, yeah, like Mike Adams. Yeah, well, that's pretty much Mike Adams' modus operandi is that, is that he waits for these things to come out and then he'll kind of tack on that it was definitely a conspiracy afterwards. Yeah, especially with things like Ebola, they're saying very dangerous stuff, but that's a, that's a something for a different segment. <laughs> let's, let's concentrate on the, uh, the science. Yes. All right. We'll go to another story. This is one 
I found just before we went online, and it's the usual kind of thing that there's a mother in what town is it now? In Utah. And basically what happened was she woke up at 4.07 in the morning and she said, oh, there's something wrong. And they went into their daughter's bedroom. She wasn't there. And they went to the front door and they saw that a man was carrying their daughter away. Now, obviously that's quite a horrific thing, but she's gone on claiming her mother's intuition saved her and that this is something, oh, we've mothers just have this built in and we all know it and it's just you've got to go with it. And... First thing that a lot of people have pointed out is that, you know, why didn't her mother's intuition go off that they they hadn't locked the door in the first place? Or when the guy actually entered the house or went up the stairs or went into the bedroom or when he lifted the daughter or when he walked down the stairs. You know, we get this all the time. You know, people who say, oh, I had a bad feeling. I didn't go and I didn't catch the, you know, the bus that day and it crashed later. I mean, it's always kind of after the fact that people... You know, there's lots of days I have bad feelings about things, but nothing happens. Yeah, yeah. post hoc assignation of meaning to things. Yes, that's the word, exactly. But, you know, this is the exact same thing that I think it's Jenny McCarthy goes on about, you know, mother's intuition and all this. And it's always shown it's there's nothing there. It's just this whole kind of uh, what I like to call, you know, the natural or the, the intuition fallacy. Or especially just when it comes to motherhood, people tend to, oh, you know, just mother knows best all the time. And not to disrespect my own mother, but they're humans at the end of the day. Yeah. It sounds a lot like Sheldrake's ideas of morphic resonance, doesn't it? It's that similar level of pseudoscience. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's that kind of whole intuition that that bad feeling isn't that an evolutionary adaptation yeah you know of, uh back in the hunter gatherers if you're by the waterhole and you hear the rustling behind you you're better off thinking lion than it's like she said like um she woke up and she didn't feel tired and it was 4 a.m now i think we've all had that happen like you know you wake up suddenly and you're wide awake and say oh what's going on oh geez and you look at the clock "Mm, what's going on and then it's just the disorientation at first when you wake up yeah like your mind's just trying to scramble trying to figure out what's going on so but it's as kitsch says you know evolution wise it pays to be a pessimist yeah it pays to be a cynic or it pays to be miserable which works very well in scotland (laughs) That explains just the dark, clouded dreaminess that just consistently reigns upon Scotland. Yes, it's an evolutionary advantage you've given us. So, uh, like I said, we'll carry on and we'll go to Kitch's story now you've dug it up. Yep, uh, actually I was been meaning to bring this one up, found it there again. Uh, it's on the latest issue of Nature, which is, the news segment is actually quite uh Ready available. You don't have to pay to to read, which I really recommend watching or reading because they're, they're really good, good, good articles. But this one is about the Italian seismologists who were convicted in an Italian court after a magnitude six point three earthquake struck the uh, town of. La, uh, I'm sorry about my pronunciation, <laughs> Lacrilla. And knowing some of your lab mates, they're going to be very upset at your mispronunciation. Uh, that happened in. 2009, which killed 300 people. Yeah. But they were sentenced for six years for manslaughter. It's just bullshit, this case, from the get-go, because it's a shame Womble isn't here to explain it, but this, the fact is you cannot predict geological events. They're near impossible to forecast when an earthquake is going to happen. I was actually talking to my supervisor, who was actually Italian. Yeah. And he'd know more about this than I would. But his opinion of it was that they were just convicted because, you know, it's a politically easy thing to do. And then it's easier to let them out after us because the news media would die down. Obviously, the news media were in Italy were um, out for heads. The fact that this had happened and these guys were just offered this bait. You can see there's not much news about them as far as I know in Italy about these guys getting off but I may be wrong on that I might, my source might be wrong <laughs> yeah, it's the very kind of what's all too common now in the media is the scapegoating of scientists for things that go wrong 
like I said, these guys, they couldn't predict it. And it's more amazing that they actually got to court. They heard the case. I'm just thinking the scientists must have had like other science advisors who must have been trying to hammer home this point, showing all the data from everywhere in the world that, you know, you cannot predict an earthquake. It's impossible. I'm just more amazed that any kind of judge or jury would ignore all of that. As far as I'm aware of, there was a series of quakes leading up to this, but that really doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Because the the first of the seismologists had a look and they said, well, these series of quakes could be leading up to something, but then again, it, there's nothing definite here to say that there's a major quake pending. Now, they got it wrong, but that's just what it's like in geology. Uh, you can't really hammer on a date, uh, you know, specific date, time for an earthquake. It's just not that simple. Doesn't it say at the end of the story that um, it can still be overturned, this decision? And lawyers for the families of the deceased have announced that they will challenge the ruling in the Supreme Court. So this story is not over by the sounds of things. True, but I really don't think that that's going to go any further because every a lot of scientists in Italy, as far as I know, and obviously throughout the world, are infuriated that they were convicted. So I don't think they'll, they'll do that. This is something else the media plays into badly, like, uh, well, we'll probably get onto this with Phil later when it comes to science and all of this is they always go for the emotional angle rather than the scientific angle a lot of the time the press. Because it's easier just to push people's emotional buttons. It's like the famous thing with Jenny McCarthy when she was on, I think it was David Letterman or no, Larry King. And there was a scientist there explaining, you know, very calmly all the facts about vaccines. And she was just getting very emotional, teared up and Again, her mother's intuition and all that. And they actually sampled me and they said they sided with Jenny McCarthy because she pushed the emotional buttons. Okay, I think we'll bounce back to Zilla for another one. Okay, there's a story from the Ottawa Citizen, of all places, <laughs> that came out. Basically, Jeffrey Beale of the University of Colorado, who I think popularized the term predatory science journal. Yeah. He's gone on to state that such predatory science journals are using or being used by kind of hack pseudoscience activists in Google Scholar and that there's a massive prevalence of these science journals and their articles being posted up on Google Scholar. Now, just to check, these are the kind of journals where anyone can get published. Yeah. Whatever you've got to say, it'll get in there. Yeah, so you've got loads of things that are like from climate change denialists, people posting things up saying that there's links between vaccines and autism, all of these ridiculous pseudoscience claims. And because they're in these journals and Google Scholar doesn't seem to vet these journals very well, they are appearing in Google Scholar and getting mixed up with actual valid research. Yeah, it's a, definitely a big problem is that a lot of people don't know what it means when science is published. And they don't even know that just because it is published doesn't mean it's accepted yet. I mean, this is your kind of area, catch this. Just because it's published, it doesn't mean it's gospel. A lot of people can come and, and challenge it, uh, especially now in the era of the internet where you can have a thing as no, that is known as post-peer review where people can look at the article and criticize it. And that's actually the basis of the website of PubPeer where you can criticize scientific articles. Yeah. And at the end of the day, peer review isn't perfect and a lot of things can get through. The Solani papers, for example, on GMOs, uh, you know, the famous, or should I say infamous uh, Solani paper on I think it was BT endotoxins. I'm trying to remember, Miles did a video on it. I oh, know it was the herbicide where uh, a pint of Roundup was actually in the data. Looked if you were a male and you drank a pint of Roundup per day, that you would actually live longer. And that was <laughs> actually that's what you could only the only thing you could read from that data, and also the lack of control. Uh, 
just the small number of mice and everything, but I could go into that, but I, I don't want to turn this into a let's bash this paper. Yeah. Although I can do that for later segments. <laughs> it would be easy to do. But I think as, as Joan Beale points out, science is a cumulative process. Uh, he says, when junk science is published bearing the imprint of actual science, later scientists may inadvertently use that work as the basis of their work, yeah. which threatens the integrity of their results. And I think the point he's getting at is that, you know, Google Scholar needs a better vetting process. It needs almost a peer review process of its own in order to make sure that only valid articles are getting posted up on it. Yeah, and even on the scientific, the actual scientific journals, it, there's just so many now, there's so many scientists publishing so many uh, reports that the review process can get quite hectic and quite overwhelming. So that's why you start to see these papers getting published. We just need to find a way to um, to make sure that reviewers don't find themselves trapped because the reviewers, this isn't their job. The reviewers who are reviewing these articles are not paid. It's not their job. They're doing this. It's voluntary. And they also have their own jobs. They're, they'd be watching their own students, teaching, writing up their own research. It can be quite a, a laborious process. Actually, I think Phil also uh, did a video on it for 60 Symbols called Peer Review and Golden Chopsticks. And that was, I remember actually being over in Nottingham and he showed me that that paper and it was hilarious just <laughs> how bad the TEM images are. I'm just about qualified and, well, not qualified, I'm just about trained in on transmission electron microscopy. And yeah. those images are, they're just bad. Well, it's hilarious because I could actually Photoshop them better. <laughs> That's the most ridiculous thing. Was they weren't even done well as a hoax. And that's a scary thing, though. Imagine if they hadn't uh, photoshopped them badly. They would have now been in the literature and a lot of research group in a time where research funding isn't that available. We'll be trying to chase this down. Now, eventually, I'd say this will get caught because no one will be able to re reproduce the results. But it will take a ser various amount of, uh, of money and time and effort and frustration. I think it was Miles that did this. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, to show how bad some of these journals were, the ones that 9-11 truthers keep. Oh, uh, yeah. And what Miles yeah. did was, there's a site online, I can't remember the name of it, but it can create uh, technical papers for computer networking, I think it is, isn't it? It's like the Deepak Chopra, it just generates... Garbage. Just random uh, technical jargon. And it does it in a scientific paper format. It gives sources. And he said he submitted it to this journal that publishes 9-11 papers. And they accepted it. And he says there wasn't any suggestions for corrections or any, you know, improvements recommended. They just published it. And he thought, this has got to be a one-off. So he did it again using the same way, but just generates another random gibberish paper and they published it a second time, and that's when they knew that, you know, these journals, they don't have any review process whatsoever. They don't even read it. Like, you don't really need to be uh, scientifically literate to read through and spot that that's just random gibberish. Yeah. We'll go into the last story. This is one that uh, we had Spencer on from Secular Scotland in the first of the new shows, and this was the petition the Scottish Secular Society launched about guidance on the teaching of creationism in Scottish schools. Now, just the little background is, at current, the educational standards are set. Basically, the teacher decides what goes in the classroom. And the current legislation is very vague and nebulous. Basically, it's as clear as mud. And so there have been quite a lot of instances of teachers saying that intelligent design is a viable option. And, you know, in biology classes, they're saying this. But basically what the petition was, it was just that there was be some guidance saying, you know, this is what the scientists say, and that's it. That's what you have to teach. And creationism is a religious thing, and you can talk about that in RE if you want. And basically this came to the Scottish Parliament this week. It was heard, and I think it's going to be raised with the Parliament. They're going to review the current legislation. And that's that's definitely good news. Hopefully uh, some... 
more work could be done. Uh, hopefully, the legislation should be made clearer. Yeah. The thing is, this is all they've asked for, is just to make it clear what is the science. and what. It's not saying this is what you should teach, but just making it clear what scientists actually say. And the Scottish creationist lobby has dug, as Zilla has seen online, they have really dug their heels in very, very hard over this. They're claiming that this is atheist brainwashing. They're claiming, you know, or you want politicians to set the educational curriculum and all this. Yeah, it seems to be their their go-to tactic is, is to really dig their heels in and try and stop any kind of, well, try and present themselves as being scientifically unbiased and everybody else is scientifically biased. You get the same thing with... Um astrologists as well if you criticize astrology they'll start digging their heels in trying to do the same thing i can see how you know i don't think it should be completely outlawed the mention of these subjects it may be you know how in a physics class you might talk about um how we used to believe the earth was flat but through all this now you know and then you can show the kids Basically, this is how we know the Earth is round and how it's orbiting the Earth. You know, all these calculations we can do or all these simple experiments. I mean, I think that's fine enough in a science class. Yeah, if you're going to introduce it in a way of of being able to teach the subject and and put things in a historical context, that's fine. But if you're going to introduce already discredited theories as if they still have any relevance, then... You're not teaching science. Basically, the aim of this petition is just teach the science, and that's it. I mean, there is the intelligent design stuff, and let's face it, (laughs) we've always said intelligent design, it is creationism, regardless of how hard they try and dress it up. It's blatantly, they use the exact same arguments there. I think we've got time for one more story. I don't know, Zillard, do you have another one prepared there? It's a bit of a tragic one. All right. Mother kills autistic son to end fictional abuse. Um, Found this on discovery.com. Apparently, I think it's in New York, a lady killed her son or has admitted killing her son with a, a lethal overdose of medications because she believed that her son was being abused by her ex-husband and that her ex-husband was going to get custody of him and the way that she ascertained that he was being abused was a technique called facilitated communication so basically her son's autistic i think and has difficulty communicating himself so what she did was was this facilitated communication technique which is basically the same thing as ouija boarding whereby she held a blackberry up held his hand and guided his hand over the BlackBerry device to try and type out what she thought he was trying to communicate to her. Right. And came up with all this evidence that she thinks she has of him being abused by a whole myriad of people, including her ex-husband. Although it's come out that there's no evidence of any abuse, sexual or otherwise, in this kid's history. Yeah, it's... For me, this is one of the examples of, you know, people are always saying about our show, why do you criticize people's beliefs and all this? You know, none of this does any harm. And at the end of the day, sadly, some of this does end up to very tragic consequences. Yeah, yeah, you know, that people do suffer physical harm because of this stuff and people's lives do get ended because yeah. of it. I mean, because one thing is like astrology, I mean... We all think it's silly, but, you know, when people are planning their lives on this, I think that's quite tragic because they could be missing out on some great experiences. But, you know, I've met people in my life, a girl I knew, she said, I won't date that guy, he's this. I said, well, you know, he could be, you know, your future husband, the love of your life, but, you know, you're rejecting him just on this. I mean, I find that it's a bit tragic, to be honest, things like that, I think. But it sounds like that guy had a lucky escape. Yeah. But then, and, and, but sadly she's, she could have lost out on a, on a wonderful part. I mean, I mean, I get this so often from people that I should just leave everyone alone, 
believe what you want in it and say, well, there are times you just have to say, look, no, this is just ridiculous, stop it. Or at least try and explain to people why some of these things can be harmful. So, Kitch, do you have anything to add to that? <laughs> uh, no, it just shows the harm of even just the modest of pseudoscience. Yeah, because like to go back to something we had earlier, like the mother's intuition, that could be lead to some really dire consequences. Like, you know, we gave the example of Jenny McCarthy. She's very big on her mother's intuition thing. And that leads to some mothers choosing not to vaccinate their children, which can lead to the worst possible consequence ever imaginable for any parent. Yeah, there's that ridiculous um, pressure group, wasn't there, of mothers against vaccines or something like that, who were claiming that their intuition was better than all the scientific papers that pointed towards no link between autism and, and vaccines. And they got a massive media hype, again, just because of the emotive language they were using and not because of any science that, that they had, because they didn't have any science. Yeah. All right, I think we're coming up to the end of the news, unless, do you have any final words, guys, there? Stay tuned for the Phil Moriarty uh, interview. Coming and up. Zilla, you'll be popping up later. I don't know what your segment's going to be. Have you decided on your new segment yet? Yeah, yeah, it's it's still in the in the writing process. It'll be recorded soon and and up by the time this this thing goes up. All right, <laughs> so no sneak preview then. Not as of yet. Yeah, it's geometry based. Got to be looking into various applications, but also pitfalls of of where people go wrong with it. All right, and stay tuned for Lundy and Marty coming up, and also the Phil Moriarty interview. And we'll speak to everyone at the end of the show. So enjoy. Welcome back to Philosophy 101 with Big Lundy. Last time we tackled the basics of logic what it is, how to construct a statement, and what a fallacy is. Today we're going to go a bit off the beaten path here and introduce another branch of philosophy, epistemology. Have you ever come across a presuppositional apologist before? If you haven't, good for you. They're a right pain. In the case that you haven't, the basic tact of one of these types of people is to get you to question the basic precepts of what it is that you think you know. Epistemology surrounds this question, that is, how do we know what we think we know? There are many philosophies that surround epistemology, and in later segments we might do some explanations of some of them, but for right now we're just going to go over the basics. So how do you know things? Well, there's a million ways that you can say that you know things, but the first thing you need to always bear in mind is that knowledge is something in general that is a strange notion. Why? Well, because the question still remains as to what exactly is knowledge in itself. Keeping it brief, the way most people use the word knowledge is intended to mean absolute certainty. Now, the problem here is that there are so few things that deal in absolutes. So what about things you know that aren't absolute? If it's not an absolute certainty that you ate Pop-Tarts when you were eight years old for breakfast on the first Friday of March, but you're mostly sure it's the case, for whatever reason this may be, you would call that approximate knowledge. Approximate knowledge covers most knowledge that we have, that is, propositions that are true to the best extent that we can determine. So, we have absolute certainty, and we have approximate knowledge. But where do we start? That's a good question. From here, we have three different avenues to explore. Foundationalism, coherentism, and foundierentism. Foundationalism is the intuitive starting point of epistemology. That being that we start from a certain point and go as far back as we can with our knowledge and build from there. This starting point is what we call a properly basic belief. Coherentism is separate in that truth statements, or the manner in which we find out that things are true, is if the statements are that we are examining fall within a coherent structure with regards to the rest of our beliefs. Basically, all your beliefs have to jive with one another in order for any of them to be possibly true. Foundierentism 
is the newest main philosophical model of epistemology, as the name implies, foundationalism and coherentism are combined into one. Foundationalist basic beliefs are the starting point of our epistemologies, and we also seek to find a coherent understanding of reality that flows from said basic beliefs and all jive with one another. These models were formed in order to address what is known as the regress argument. Remember when I brought up the presuppositional apologetics? Well, that's what the regress argument is. Can you justify a certain truth statement? If you can, can you justify that justification? Can you justify the justification of that justification? How do you know that? How do you know that? Well, how do you know that? How do you know that you know that? How do you know that you know that you know that? You know, that crap. That very annoying crap. This continues forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Foundationalism denies that all justifications require themselves justifications. Some justifications require them, but after a certain point, you don't need to justify them any further, because to ask to justify certain things start to become pointless and meaningless and trivial and just silly. Coherentism rejects the notion that a justification takes the form of a separate needing-to-be-justified proposition. If I justify a proposition then do I necessarily have to justify that justification as well? Maybe I don't. Maybe that's not the purpose of the justification. Maybe that's not the purpose of the statement that's made in order to make the justification. Foundiratism says that the answer is actually both. Not only do we not always have to require a justification for a justification, but one of the reasons for that could possibly just be that Well, a justification isn't something that needs to be justified as a proposition because it's not one. Are you confused yet? Awesome. Next week, we'll be going over these in a bit more depth, but for now, you have some mandatory reading to do. Look up foundationalism, coherentism, and foundierentism, and read up on their history and prevalence in modern philosophy of epistemology. And I will see you next time. In part two of this series on geometry, we're going to look at one of the earliest applications of this branch of mathematics and see how, even in its beginnings, it both led to advances in knowledge while simultaneously falling into the pitfalls of pseudoscience. Some of the earliest recorded applications of geometry date back to the second millennia BCE in the regions of Mesopotamia and Egypt. As we have seen, one of the areas it was applied to and one of the first branches of science it helped spawn was astronomy. In this early agricultural age, understanding the passage of the seasons was vital, and the earliest geometers recognized a link between this and the positions of the stars in the sky. They noticed that some stars were only visible at certain times in the year, and that their position in the sky changed during the year. For instance, Taurus isn't visible from May to June, as it is hidden behind the sun. Similarly, Scorpio isn't visible from November to December for the same reason. This is simply because, as the Earth orbits the Sun, some constellations will be hidden behind the Sun and won't be visible again until the Earth's position moves, so that they aren't lost in the glare of the Sun's light. Or, more accurately, lost in the light from the Sun that gets scattered through our atmosphere during the daytime. If we didn't have any atmosphere, the daytime sky would look very different and we would be able to see stars even whilst the sun is still up. They also noticed the changing phases of the moon which coincided with the tides, and particularly the flooding seasons of the rivers in the Indus Valley and the Nile Delta. Keeping track of the positions of these stars and the phases of the moon enabled our ancestors to predict the seasons and control their agriculture and conduct their farming practices accordingly. It seems very possible that the first constellations were created as a useful mnemonic device to track the seasons by creating patterns in the stars relating to characters and forming a story or a narrative that describe the passage of the seasons. It's not surprising how pareidolia has played a major role in our understanding of the night sky and our inclination to find hidden personal meaning in the stars seems intricately intertwined with the history of astronomy. One can even imagine, as an ancient king, that seeing how the stars seem to presage the passage of the seasons, one might also use them to predict the rise and fall of one's reign and the outcome of battles. 
After all, if the motions of the stars can affect the whole world in the profound way that they appeared to, then why shouldn't they also affect people's lives in a similarly profound way? Indeed, many early astronomers doubled up as astrologers and advisors to royal houses, not least because predicting the outcomes of battles was a very lucrative business. Who doesn't want to know the future, especially if it can help you stay in power, find happiness, or even just stay alive? The stories that describe the passage of seasons soon became interlaced with stories describing the fates of kingdoms, rulers, and heroes, and even then to predict the fates of ordinary people. It would be clearly unfair, given how connected astronomy and astrology were in those early years, to label our ancestors as stupid. Not only were they clearly some of the most talented geometers of their age who conducted incredible work in their field, but also the very pattern-finding process that led them into the pitfalls of pareidolia was the same process that led them to make the advances they did in mapping the stars and beginning to understand the motions of the heavens and their connection to phenomena here on Earth. And let us not forget, as we noted in the last episode, that it was the work of these early astronomers that enabled us to realize the shape of the Earth itself. Not a bad achievement for a group of people who didn't have the ability to leave the surface of the planet. I think it's also important to note that it was the work done by these early geometers that laid the foundations for what would become modern physics. When Isaac Newton quoted Bernard of Chartres by saying, "If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants." These are the giants to whom he is referring, and we do well to remember them as such, both to give them their due and also to acknowledge, as Neil deGrasse Tyson does, that even our most talented minds, when they reach the limits of their understanding, are prone to making mistakes. And this is not a trivial point, since the links between astronomy and astrology lasted long into the time of Newton, who may himself have studied it. And some of the greatest names in physics and astronomy were also interested in astrology, including Galileo, Brahe, and Kepler. However, it's also easy to forget that objections to astrology are not a new phenomenon. Cicero produced the twins' objection in the first century BCE, showing that people born at similar times would have vastly different fates, and that astrology wrongly ignores all the other more readily apparent variables that affect people's lives, such as inherited traits, parenting, advances in medicine, etc. It was during the Age of Enlightenment that intellectual sympathy for astrology really began to wane, though, and astronomers began to cut their ties with the mystical and esoteric cousin of their craft. Though it would find a revival in the 19th century, primarily as the counter movement to modernism began to take hold. Despite this revival, the objections remained, with even more valid objections being raised, some of which are very sophisticated. For instance, there is no known mechanism by which the motions of bodies in the sky can determine our fates in the very personal way advocated by astrologers. Neither gravity or electromagnetism are viable mechanisms, since, for example, the electrical fields of normal household appliances are much more significant to us than the electromagnetic field of, say, Jupiter. The Earth's axial precession has also made the horoscope meaningless, with Sharpak and Brock referring to astrology based on the tropical zodiac as being empty boxes that have nothing to do with anything and are devoid of any consistency or correspondence with the stars. As the two fields began to properly diverge, the contrast between them became even more stark, most notably in the area concerning actual knowledge of the night sky itself. Today, you are lucky to find an astrologer who can perform even the most basic measurements of your most amateur astronomer. In the exact same way that proponents of sacred geometry will go on and on about pretty shapes and their supposed meanings, but will be completely unable to perform a simple run line calculation or have a heart attack if you show them the Haversine formula. Indeed, they'll even fail to accurately define what a dimension is for you. The astrologers of today are more fixated on finding vague meanings in the stars than in even finding the stars themselves. To deal with the objections that have been raised throughout the years, modern astrologers have retreated into making vague statements that can be true of pretty much everyone at any time, and which, in turn, lack any predictive power or ability to describe reality. It's amusing to think that the early Egyptians viewed part of the constellation we now know of as Ursa Major, or the Plough, depending on who you speak to, as a man with his head stuck up a bull's arse. What better metaphor could you ask for to depict astrology? Still, it is important to remember the contributions that early investigations into astrology and astronomy have made. 
whilst the constellations are nothing more than arbitrarily assigned patterns, they have become a tool for us to both navigate around the Earth and navigate our way around the stars. If you know your position and the time of year, you can figure out what stars you should be able to see and where they should be in the sky. Not only this, but if you know the time of year, you can use the positions of the stars to find your position on the surface of the Earth. And if you know where you are, you can use the position of the stars to know what time of year it is. Astronomers and astrophysicists still use the constellations as a tool to find and describe the positions and motions of bodies in the sky. Perhaps it is a fitting recognition of the fact that these two subjects were once so closely related. The important thing to take away from all this is that subjects of pseudoscience and science are often related in their distant history, often being indistinguishable as in the case of astronomy and astrology in their early years. This isn't really surprising, since both pseudoscience and science are about finding patterns in the world. The only distinction between them is that science relies on reproducibility and is conducted with the necessary controls to account for things like pareidolia and preventing our propensity to seek out patterns from running amok and making us reach false conclusions. However, in the early stages of discovery and investigation, it is inevitable that mistakes will be made, not least because early pioneers are only just beginning to understand what patterns are real and what patterns aren't. It is important to remember that we can forgive the early pioneers for their mistakes, especially given the advances they made in their fields. However, less sympathy can be given to those today who still cling to outdated modes of belief and choose, instead of taking on the hard work involved in real discovery, to take the easy route of making unsubstantiated assertions based on emotive and vague language. The former group of people were explorers, tirelessly working to discover the universe, prone to making mistakes, but whose work laid the foundations for the lives we have today. The latter group are nothing but tragic dropouts, intent on making themselves feel important by getting everyone to believe they are the purveyors of some esoteric knowledge that doesn't exist, because to do anything of merit is just too much hard work. The history of astronomy and astrology is a perfect example of the connection between science and pseudoscience and the journey to differentiate one from the other, both how they are intertwined and the process by which we disentwine them. Hello everybody and welcome to, I've lost track of which episode this is of Toronto at Logic. <laughs> <laughs> and today we have Professor Phil Moriarty who's come back to talk about science in the media. So welcome Phil. Or welcome Hi, back Jamie. I should say. Yeah, welcome Thanks back. Phil. I don't know when it was, when was it? About six months ago was it last yeah. time? You were on the charity show back in July and I think, and you were on the show about this time last year if I remember correct. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, time for early flies. <laughs> yeah, and just to introduce to everyone, of course, you had just heard Kitch there is on the panel today and Mari Ziller as well. Hello. So, yep. So I don't know who's got the first question. Zilla, I think you've been kind of chomping at the bit to go with this interview, so we'll let you kick it off. <laughs> oh, God. Right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thanks for putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> yeah, there was one thing I wanted to bring up was obviously hot in the press at the moment is the um, Comet 67P and the Rosetta probe. And just to talk about the the way they um, handled their press coverage of this, because one of the things that really struck me was watching their Twitter feed. And between the two probes, the Philae and, and Rosetta, they seem to have this strange anthropomorphism going was, on between the I two. I thought it was brilliant. It, I thought it was really good. I thought that was really clever and a really neat way of selling the science. Yeah, it was um, very, very clever. I've spent rather more time today on Twitter than I should have talking about the other aspect of that, of course, which was the stuff about the shirt, 
which perhaps we don't want to get into, but we can if you want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think we'll we'll just stick to the general kind of the presentation of the science. I mean, do you yeah. think they've done it in a good way overall, the Rosetta guys? Yeah, I think so. And the other thing was Monica Grady. Did you see the footage of her when she when 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 it landed? Oh, that was remarkable. Um, it's worth digging that out. Um, where she just goes mental because it's sort of culmination of so much. Um, yeah. So many years of work. Uh, it's it's really good to see. She really, really loses it. She literally loses it and then sort of recovers herself. It's um really good to see. I think that does a you know that level of connection and that level of just seeing the sort of human side of it and not seeing yeah. bloody scientists as you know automatons. Um, I think that's great. Anything to dispel the type of stereotypes, you know, that Big Bang theory sort of yeah, kind of. It's great to see that. The kind of anti-social kind of nerd stereotype that goes around. That it's just ordinary people kind of who are just... Indeed. They're invested and in their work. Some of those are anti-social. <laughs> some of them aren't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's... um. No, it is It's frustrating. Those type of... You know, I'm not going to say that um, there aren't those type of, of people, but there are those type of people in practically every profession, every walk of life. So it's... um. It's a bit of a shame. One of the things I really like about working with Brady Harron and the 60 Symbol stuff and the various videos we do is that he, it really is raw and it's, um, it sort of humanizes us. And you see the flaws and you see me get pissed off with them and you see others get pissed off with them. And um, I think that's good to see as long as it doesn't come to blows. <laughs> it <laughs> uh, tends to happen under high pressure environments such as university labs. Indeed. Well, what I'd really like to do, it happened... Brady did it with some of the chemists a number of years back to go to a synchrotron, but it was relatively tame in terms of when they filmed. What I'd really like to do is have a camera there in the last, say, 15 minutes before beam time ends, because it's very strictly and very tightly constrained. You have anywhere between five to seven days beam time, and it only ever works on the last day. Um, and then you're just scrambling to get things done, and it's it's always panicked in the last 15 minutes, and there's lots of frayed tempers and lots of people working 36-hour shifts. That's when you really need a camera there. Yeah. What's some of your um, the worst examples of science in the media that you see, the ones that really kind of get, get on your wick? Oh, let me see. Now you've put me on the spot. <laughs> in terms of just how it's presented, well, apart from, as I said, the, the sort of stereotype, the other aspect of it that I, I sort of dislike is the overselling. Um, I've talked about how Brady's videos are very raw. There's the general, this is true though of pretty well all television these days, you know, there's the general place everything as a competition, everything's against the clock. We've got to get this done by the last two minutes. Will they make it? Can they possibly get the experiment done? And, you know, sort of right of the Valkyries music in the background, the horsemen of the apocalypse coming over the hill. You know, just overblowing. And the problem is, you know, you keep ratcheting up the hyperbole and you reach the limit at some point. I think we've reached that limit, which is why, you know, it's refreshing. I think this is why all the YouTube stuff has really taken off, because a lot of that is really quite raw and um, connects you a little bit better than the, the very glossy productions. And universities are really bad at this. You know, it's the same type of bloody soft focus approach with the tinkly music in the background. And um that doesn't really connect. But in terms of, I'm struggling to think of a really bad example of where they've got the science wrong. You know, of course, there's things like the Daily Mail, which just, you know, <laughs> yeah, is just off the scale in terms of how it misrepresents science. But generally, the BBC does a fairly good job. The broadsheets here, the Independent, the Guardian do a pretty good job. There's some really good science journalists out there. And, you know, they get a lot of flack sometimes for, you know, misrepresenting the science. But Scientists can be just as bad because what happens is they often they leave the PR to the, you know, the press office in the university and the press office generally just exaggerates and blows up out of all proportion, the tiniest little advance. And so you can't blame the journalists for working from a press release. And if that press release is overblown, then scientists have to take some responsibility for that. Now the examples are coming to me, you know, the the, the classic like MMR, etc. That was a really bad yeah. example. Generally, when scientists go to the press before they go through peer review, which has its flaws, but before they go through peer review, that's a big red flag generally. That was an awful long answer, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's all right. Because <laughs> uh, I think one of the main examples of, you know, really bad science communicators is the climate debate where 
the justice in the debate, but it's all continually been um, portrayed as if there is this massive di- divide when there just doesn't exist. It's a very, very interesting one. Um, I absolutely agree. This idea of balance is always an issue. And also the sort of creationist side of things, of course, is the idea you've always got to have balance. If somebody's talking about evolution, there's got to be some bollocks on the other side. So, you know, I get that. The interesting thing about the climate change thing. So I've um, I'm doing a fourth year module at the mo- moment, which is rather different from the, all the other modules I've called. It's called the philosophy, perception and politics of physics where it it brings together a lot of things like, you know, logic, induction, deduction, Mm. politics, news, media, etc. The very interesting thing about climate change and presenting those results is I'm pretty certain all four of us here and many of those listening Mm. would be pretty well decided in our views on anthropomorphic, man-made climate climate change, global warming, etc. Have we read the papers? No. Have we done the experiments? Have we looked at the simulations? We've not done any of those things. So the question, and I'm an atheist, the question you've got to ask yourself is, how different is that from faith? And this is the problem. We can come across all heavy-handed and, uh, you know, high-minded, etc., and say that we're totally objective. But if you put yourself, and I'm not, you know, suggesting for one minute that, um, you know, I have any sympathy with the sort of climate change denial view, but... I can't dismiss out of hand their argument that, well, you know, what you're doing is faith, which is often comes a, a large number of times. And that's a very unsettling position for a scientist to be in because, you know, Feynman has got this statement, which I love to quote, science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. But it's not really. That's not really how science works. Science builds on what others have done. There's an awful lot of stock placed in previous work. There's an awful lot of stock placed in reputation. And so it's an interesting one. And then trying to get that across in the media and trying to pull out those nuances. And it's tricky. It's very tricky. Kitch, I think we'll go over to you. Sorry, I'm just trying to get my mind to work now. <laughs> <laughs> It's tricky at this time of night, isn't it? You've just been, you were celebrating yesterday, weren't you? No, it got cancelled actually at the last second. It's been postponed. Oh, so, so instead okay. I decided to go into work for today, just try to get some stuff set up. Okay. Well, congratulations but, uh, on it anyway. So that's, that's good. Uh, cheers. Thank you. Adam, um, I went to a midterm review myself for a, a European network a couple of weeks ago. So I know just how bloody stressful they can be. The stress wasn't wasn't quite the word I was going for, but we're just overjoyed. Yeah. Okay, but good. I actually had a point, sorry, there just there. I just remembered that um you said that the pre PR for universities, they have a tendency maybe to get the signs wrong or not just quite right. That actually reminds me of when I had to do a press release for my own lab for my own research and it was sent off to a journalist that they hired in. They were just doing kind of a wrap up of or not wrap up. They're just going to cover all this research that goes on at DCU. And my project is on preparing nanomaterials uh, using biological systems. And that's basically the main area of my research. But I said such an applications could be for cancer research and the big bold headline was yeah. scientists researching new novel ways for cancer therapy and I was like no this is not what I'm doing at all this yeah. is just a kind of confirming if the nanoparticles were producing are any good yeah once and you that's just sensationalize and but at least you refer to as a scientist rather than a boffin generally <laughs> um it's boffins have busted through something or other a lot of the tabloids over here it's, you, you never call a scientist you always call a boffin this just seems to be in that kind of journalism that it's more sensationalized to grab the headline. I think, Michael, it, it really does depend on where the journalist's coming from. I must admit, of all that, you know, I haven't done a huge amount, but in terms of interacting with, uh, you know, for example, The Guardian, The Independent, um, n- nature science journalists, it's a, they generally do a pretty bloody good job, I think. They they take a lot of facts from a range of different sources and they usually do a pretty good job. The tabloids, I agree. Obviously, it will be over sensationalized and certain websites as well. io9 being one will sensationalize and rip out a lot of the detail. But I think it's important. There are a lot of good science journalists out there who sometimes get tarred 
um, with the same brush as everybody else. And they're, they're doing a damn good job a lot of the time. So, yeah, it really depends on the journalist and it depends on your PR office. And often I think a lot of the blame can be directed at the PR office as well. Do you think also maybe some of the problem is, I don't know, the best way I can be is having to translate a science paper into public reading? Because I've read scientific papers and if you're not prepared for it, it can, even the most simplest scientific paper can just go way over your head easily. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But that's a really good point. Translating that down is not easy and generally you need to have a pretty good background. And often the problem is, Again, I'll, I'll quote Feynman because, you know, I've got to quote Feynman yet again. <laughs> you know, he was asked after the Nobel Prize, could um, a journalist came up to him and said, could you explain to me in five minutes what it's all about? And Feynman said, listen, buddy, if I could explain it to you in five minutes, it wouldn't have won a Nobel Prize. And so some of these things are conceptually tricky and trying to reduce them down. I, I st- certainly struggle with this an awful lot, even in first year, you know, and certainly going out to do schools talks and doing public talks, really struggle with introducing analogies. And sometimes those analogies just don't really capture it. And on one side, you can go, well, OK, as long as you get some flavor of it. But on the other hand, if you're misrepresenting it for you as the person who's presenting it, it can leave a sort of sour taste, if you know what I mean. But it's a really tricky juggling act to Explain it in a way that's, you know, engaging and connects with people who don't have a scientific background and yet capture the science correctly. And there are, you know, a few people are really good at that. Sean Carroll's really good at that. Brian Green's really good at that. Brian Cox is actually really good at that, I would say. The furore about the pilot exclusion principle notwithstanding. But um, those are pretty good people. Alice Roberts is another one. So, you know, there are people who can do it, but it takes a lot of work. Yeah, and no, not just reading the science, but actually getting a hold of a scientific paper. That's another stumbling. Like even for myself, like, you know, I'm not a scientist. I'm, I work in engineering, but, you know, I see these claims and, and I, as a skeptic, I want to check them out. But then, you know, I go, I see the abstract and then click read full text. 50 quid, 50 quid. What the hell? <laughs> yeah. So the great thing, I'm very de- delighted you brought that up. So the, the great thing is that UK scientists, if they're funded by, and engineers, yeah. Um, if they're funded by the research councils, there are seven research councils in the UK. We are now mandated to publish in open access. All right. Through, or what's That's called the gold open access. Or we could go down that route. It's tedious, but it is important. It's like Ben Goldacre says all the important stuff is buried behind a force field of tedium. But there's different types of open access, but we're mandated to publish in open access journals, which is great. In nanotechnology in particular, there's a fantastic journal called the Bilestein Journal of Nanotechnology, where it's free of charge to the author and it's free of charge to the reader entirely. That's because the Bilestein Foundation has got very deep pockets indeed. What pisses me off is that we recently had a paper in one of the Nature Publishing Group journals, three and a half thousand pounds to have it published open access. That's on top of the subscription we pay to that bloody journal. It's also on top of the fact that they send us a four-page checklist of everything we have to do to the paper in terms of typesetting it. Yeah. The, the profit margins are through the roof, and I really cannot wait, and I hope before I retire, we'll see a situation where those large academic publishers are dead, everything's done online. The reason it'll take a long time for them to die is because a scientist's career, and you will both, or three of you will probably know this, is science exists career depends on the, the sort of brand name, the journal that you're, you're publishing in. A near paper, Nature Science, Cell, if you're in that field, or those type of journals can make or break somebody's career. I wanted to just very quickly get back to, um, you brought up the issue of analogies, and you've spoken a little bit about, um, obviously, using YouTube to talk about science. Anybody who's watched 60 Symbols has obviously seen you on that and enjoyed your to and fro with Brady and how you both interact with each other. And I was just wondering, given the last couple of videos, have you settled on a description of entropy that you're happy with? (laughs) Oh, that's a great, great question. So, yeah, the entropy video, I, I actually wrote a blog post about that as well, about somebody said there was one person who was not at all happy that left actually quite a... Generally, if it's um, not a particularly well-written or coherent comment, I don't really care if it's not particularly happy with the video. But this guy wrote quite a coherent comment, and he basically it started off with, this video is appalling, <laughs> and got better from there. 
And from <laughs> a certain perspective, I can empathize entirely with them because entropy in a first year course, I spent four lectures. So 200 minutes on entropy alone, starting off, building it up from the ground up to try and put that across in 10 minutes is really difficult. The only thing I wanted to get across with that video is that it's not just, you know, you, using the idea of entropy as disorder, you have to be really, really careful because entropy can often drive order. Um, of course, it depends on how you define order. And also the idea, the other one that I really enjoyed debating with video with Brady is this idea of, you know, a messy room or messy teenager's room is a very good example of the second law of thermodynamics. First of all, if you take it literally, of course it isn't. But many people, Brady refuses to believe this, but I've seen the forums, I've had the emails, quite a few people do take it very literally that as a room gets messy, it's an example of the second law of thermodynamics, which it's not. And uh, the second thing, even as an analogy, I have difficulties with it. Now, I'm taking that analogy, I guess, rather too literally, but having taught this, I know how damaging that analogy can be because the important thing with entropy is things moving around randomly. Was it the BBC stargazing? I think it was either earlier this year or last year's one. They showed a an analogy of entropy where it was they asked people to bring in their um, headphones in their pockets yeah. and bring them out of their pockets, and they were all in a disordered state. And she was trying to use that as an example or an yeah. analogy for for how entropy works. Was that a good analogy? Ish. That's better. I think that's a better analogy because at least it's got the idea that you're randomizing the system and it's exploring states. My problem is that the idea of somebody, you're just moving it around and that random motion is sort of getting it to knot up. It's, it's a better example. My problem is that the thing with the messy teenager doesn't have the distinction between work and heat effectively. When the teenager moves something, he's doing work on those objects. And it's conscious work or it's moving around it, it's very, very different from what happens in thermodynamic entropy, where, you know, those molecules can move around, they can access those states, they can evolve, if you want to call it that, to a certain configuration. The messy room doesn't capture that. And for, you know, at A level, leaving cert or whatever, perhaps it's okay. When it gets into first year, it's trying to get rid of the misconceptions is a little bit tricky. So the, the tangled up headphones, I think, is a slightly better example, yes. You're talking about the analogies there, and I know you've touched on this in one of your videos, is like the people that watch your videos and then think, oh, I've got it. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Because I know that kind of, it's another one of your little things. Yeah, that yeah, no, that's another one of my bugbears. I, you know, you get the comment down below, as I said, it's, you know, um, can somebody explain to me in two sentences what entropy is? No, no. Uh, you know, it, we've just got to draw a line and say, you know, at some <laughs> point, if you want a good under deep understanding, you have to go away and, and, you know, use different sources and read up on it. You know, if I want to understand biochemistry, it's not my area. If I want to understand biochemistry, I don't think I'm going to get a deep understanding of biochemistry if I watch a five minute video on YouTube. Similarly, I'm not going to get a deep understanding of so many very complex concepts in physics by watching a five minute video. The whole point of those videos, and I think most of the people making them, Brady, of course, Derek Muller, Veritasium, Michael from Vsauce, Henry, Miniver, they would say, you know, that's not the be all and end all. It's this is your starting place. And you use that to go and, you know, read up and do more, you know, just mm -hmm. inform yourself about it. The problem with the YouTube aspect is that we're creating a perception that to learn what you need to do is find the right video and to find the most engaging and entertaining presenter and that's how you learn and that's a very dangerous very bad way of putting across learning because to truly learn something you're an engineer. You'd have done. I'm sure you've been in this position as I have. You're banging your head against something. You're going, I just can't understand this. And you try and come at it from different ways and suddenly something clicks. You get it from some yeah. particular perspective. It can cause you a lot of pain learning. And, um, I would love to, I'd love to do an experiment where it took a number of, of people who watched those videos, watch them and then take them away for a few days and then ask them a few very basic questions about the physics associated with one of those things to see how much of it sticks. Because I think very little of it sticks. So basically so, the videos are just sort of just to whet the appetite kind of thing. That's how I see them. Yeah. And um, 
We certainly do our best to try and make them as clear as possible, to try and engage people. But the, the real key example for me was the Why is Glass Transparent video, where I had one aspect. You know, the reason glass is transparent is incredibly complex. We covered one aspect of that. And then you get comments on, on there, but this can't be all that it is. Of course it can't be all that it is. You know, in five minutes, how can it be all that it is? And then you say it's a 20, you know, optics is generally at least a 20 lecture course. Yeah. And that's my problem. That's, and it's, you know, I, you, I go on ahead. I like making these videos. They're a hell of a lot of fun. It's great interacting with Brady. But, um, as Ian was saying earlier, what I really like is actually the, the most recent ones where it's a real debate and it shows you science as science works, where it's about a debate. It's about an interaction. It's about both of us struggling to sort of come to terms with something. Me trying to explain it to Brady, not getting the right analogies or whatever. And I, for me, that's much healthier than presenting. Well, here's five minutes and here's how it works. And um, I sort of received wisdom from the experts. So again, that's what I, that's why I continue doing them. That's, and the more we can do that way, the better. It might be more confusing for the audience, but you know what? That might be a good thing. Yeah. I've experienced this in my work with you, prototyping of things. And, you know, I can come home with my head in my hands, just wondering, we've done nothing all day. We've tried to get this thing to work. Yeah. yeah. And then it goes on for weeks. And then when it finally works, you, oh, that's it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And there's something about, you know, just how the neurons connect together yeah. that you just don't capture in a five minute video. <laughs> I find even myself when I'm, I've been working with electrochemical cells and studying how bacteria generate an electrical current. And I'm still finding after going into my third year now, a PhD studying this, having been doing it for a fourth year as well. I'm still finding out things and I'm still just looking at data and having no idea what it actually means. And that's not just down to me being stupid. It's just, I'm just not an electrochemist. I haven't got the experience, even though I've been looking at this thing for two years. I'm still yeah. finding out know, some interesting things, some interesting science. Yeah, I dipped my toes into electrochemistry and I got my toes back out very quickly indeed a few years ago. It's um, <laughs> it's a really tricky area and controlling the variables and getting reproducibility, uh, it drove me up the wall. So we don't do oh. electrochemistry anymore. I found out that even some of the most bizarre things that uh, in the electrochemical cell that you wouldn't think would actually affect, such as the roughness of the glass at the at exactly. the edge, can affect yeah. the signal. No, we found exactly the same thing. And then the problem is you you run a few experiments and your surface roughness changes. You get different. Yeah, it's 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 a nightmare. There was one thing we talked about this in. Well, it'll be the earlier segment in the show, and it's about the presentation of scientists, especially in news. And the example we had, it's quite a famous, I don't know if you've ever seen, I think it was a Larry King interview. They were talking about vaccines, and they had a virologist, and they had Jenny McCarthy on. I know you're from, but, you know, he was calmly, you know, he was giving all his facts and data, but then you had Jenny McCarthy, and she was welling up, and, you know, yeah. my instincts as a mother tell me that vaccines are just so terrible. Right. I mean, how do you kind of deal with folk? Because there's a lot of that, I find, like with the pseudoscience, they hit the emotional button so well. Absolutely brilliant question. Um, I was involved in something called the MP Scientist Pairing Scheme, which the Royal Society runs. About this time last year, it was December last year, so we spent a week in Westminster. And the message we got time and time again is, um, in, you know, from science advisors, people involved, there were people from the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology about, you know, uh, evidence-based policy. Evidence-based policy is, you know, is a misnomer. They want evidence, obviously, that backs up a particular ideology. Then it's fine. If it works against that, they chuck it out and they cherry pick the data. But again, even in that case, the evidence is right at the bottom. They have pie charts and they have stats, etc. But that's really often they don't even look at those. That's just to give an illusion that um, something's been done or to put across a message that this has been looked at carefully. What sells is anecdote. And story, exactly as you say. And um, being enthusiastic, being passionate about something, you are going to connect with an audience a hell of a lot more than somebody who comes across as the stereotypical automaton, just putting the dry facts and figures across. And that's something that for a scientist is really difficult to deal with because the science, the numbers, the data, the evidence are such a small part of the public perception, such a small part of the story. 
And we generally go, well, if we have more evidence, of course, we're going to convince people. But we're not. The best evidence in the world, the strongest case might do terribly against a very poor set of evidence, but evidence that is marketed, branded, put across much better with the right type of personalities. That's really unsettling for a scientist to hear, but that was the message we got time and time again, that science data comes well down the pecking order below, for example, budgetary concerns and how will this play in the Daily Mail. Just to branch off that on a different topic, for such a thing for a live debate, it's extremely hard to fact check your opponent. So that's why I think that live debates for scientists are actually a really bad idea, especially against pseudoscientists, because you, you can't really check their data. You can't really say, well, hold on, that's actually not right, unless you have memorized the paper. Precisely. Yeah. And no, that's a at, very good point. In fact, I think, who is this? Lord Moncton, he's... He did that in a TV interview in, against oh, yeah. in Australia. I think Paul Holler did a video on it as a while ago. But it's just an extremely bad idea unless you know exactly who you're debating and know the kind of topics they're going to bring up. Because very often I find just going through these different debates is that the same topics come up and up again for the same people because they don't really have much of a imagination. But often they have a very good story. And often they are pretty good, both the sort of pseudoscience side, but also from the fundamentalist side. Often they're very accomplished speakers and they can put the story across. And we go into those often thinking, well, the evidence is on our side, but that's not what sells the story. And that's not what gets the, the, the public and gets the vote, basically. It's how well, you know, the medium, much more than the message is the issue. And many of us are not very well equipped to do that to get that message across in the same sort of charismatic way as many pseudoscientists do. You know, Deepak Chopra's a really key example. Pure horseshit. Just an endless stream of horseshit. But how many bloody followers has he got on Twitter? How many people buy his bloody books? Why? Because he's charismatic and because he uses the right sounding words that anybody with any background in science can pick through. You know, he's a, he's an archetypal example of just what, you know, it doesn't matter what you say. It's how you say it and how you present yourself. And, you know, I'm a big Bill Hicks fan. And um, one of his most, you're probably aware, one of his most accomplished sketches is the one on marketing, which is starts off, if you're in marketing, kill yourselves. There's no joke coming, just kill yourself. And then he goes on a <laughs> rant about marketing, which is, if you haven't seen it, go and look it up. It's bloody fantastic. But the problem is, I'm not saying that marketing is a particularly, how can I put it, complicated subject, but we have to be aware of just the evidence alone won't sell it. You mentioned the votes there, and this is probably one, you know, the politics, I said, well, well, politics getting involved in science. I mean, I don't think it's a huge issue in the UK, but again, using climate change, like in America, we see it so... I mean, have you had any dealings with uh, like politics getting involved in science or do you think it's a uh, bad idea? You mean in terms it? of it's so polarized in terms of Republican versus Democrat, in terms of right wing being largely sort of denialists. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's the, and that's, again, a question of ideology. And you can throw as much evidence as you like. And that's when it when it comes back to, you know, often they will come back to the type of comments I was making right at the start about, you know, well, how do you actually know? What, why do you take these papers? Why do you have so much faith in these papers, etc.? And again, it's not the evidence that's that's really driving that message home. It's the general ideology that's behind that. Yeah, in terms of what we do, I think luckily in the UK, it's a little bit more balanced. I think in terms of the the fact that we've got a generally higher quality, whatever problems the BBC might have, and it has got some problems, it's still generally pretty good. Apart from, as you say, they've always got to bring in the other the, side. The, the, yeah, the other side, which is sometimes not the most credible. But having said that, what would happen if they didn't bring in the other side? They would get accused of bias. 
I sort of can understand why they do that. They, because if they didn't bring in that other side, no matter how bollocks it is, you know what it'd be like from reading all those bloody blogs. It'd be, oh, it's a conspiracy. You know, the establishment is keeping them out, etc. Much better, much like bringing the BMP onto uh, question time, time, time etc. Just let them come on. Let them make fools of themselves. It damages them and then go on. But we have to be willing to um, fight them on their own ground in terms of the presentation and how we connect with the, the public. And again, some of us, many of us are not well equipped to do that. There was this example that I remember, and I think it was under Tony Blair's government, they commissioned some science into, well, it was just drugs, how dangerous they were. And I think they were wanting cannabis to be still more dangerous than alcohol. I think, do you remember this? David Nutt, yeah, and yeah, David Nutt And it came and... out that alcohol was worse, and they just ignored it after that. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. again, because it's not going to sell. That was, that's, that's a key example. I used, actually used that in the 40th course. Okay. That was David Nutt, and a number of others on that committee resigned as well, because there was a great example of, oh, we want evidence-based polity. Here's the evidence. Uh, no, that's not the evidence we wanted. We're going to go with this. This is this sells our message better. And not just really didn't like that and obviously was very pissed off that all his hard work was basically sidelined for the politics. So now that, yeah, that is a, yeah, that's a very good example and a very troublesome example. But, um, we just have to get very canny about how we get the science across and just piling evidence upon evidence, piling more research upon more research. It's not going to do it. Yeah. It's really not going to do it, which um, is troublesome for a scientist yeah, cause, well, or um, an engineer. Because I remember when that um, story came out, it came out on the radio, and uh, one of my workmates just said, oh, bloody scientists, they just can't change their mind on drugs like that. Well, yeah. no, they just researched it, and that's what they found. I mean, what are you wanting? They say, oh, but they can't change, you know, just it's bad, and that's it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's exactly it. Yeah, like that's exactly it didn't when, like a lot of my workmates are anti-drugs, and they just... It didn't sell with them at all. They just, you know, cannabis is bad and that's it. End of story. Yeah. And the politician will have that in mind and the politician will have had surgery. Well, some of them will. The MPs will have had surgeries. They'll know what, where their constituents lie on this. They'll know that, well, if I go down that route, regardless of what the evidence says, my seat's troublesome, particularly if it's a marginal constituency, et cetera, et cetera. All those type of aspects. Mm. Often the answer is not more research. Often the answer is, selling better the research we have. Yeah. Oh, I can't believe I'm seeing that. Yeah. <laughs> I did want to ask a question kind of going off on a different tangent. I don't know if you saw a Guardian piece by Johnny Scaramanga in September. Oh, who was I... talking about the Christian creationist F schools and their, their qualifications. Oh, if you go down the thread on yeah. that piece, you may find a couple of comments from me. I wanted to jump on that really, really quickly. So for those who are listening, it's um, about a special type of qualification by uh, what's it called? International Christian. Can you can you remind me of what it is? International Certificate of Christian Education. Thank you, friends. ICCE, yeah, which uh, had some incredible nonsense in there about a range of very pseudoscientific facts in inverted commas coupled into the Bible. And apparently there were four universities who were accepting this. Now, there's been a lot going on ever since that article over the last few months. I think it's even more worrisome than that. I think that Nottingham was actually a little bit more honest than others because I think the the many other universities were accepting this as well. They just weren't quite as open when it came to the freedom of information request. That isn't to say that they were lying, um, Your Honour. <laughs> <laughs> Allegedly, et cetera, et cetera. But um, they might have couched the response to the, uh, the freedom of information request from Johnny in a little bit more um, uh, of a subtle way. Let's put it that way. I'm not suggesting at all that we're lying. But um, certainly I'm undergraduate admissions tutor. Um, well, I'm one part of the undergraduate admissions tutor team at Nottingham. And um, that worried the hell out of me. So I went to the head of school and I said, look, we really need to stamp on this very quickly. So luckily he and I are off a of mind and there's just no way we'd ever accept that qualification. And the worrisome thing, the really worrying thing, of course, is that people are being educated that way. 
uh, yeah, I found his article really, because he went through that system, I found his article really um, unnerving. I must admit, you know, 21st century Britain and this crap is still proliferating. Is that something, I mean, Nottingham's obviously been named in his article. Is that something that Nottingham has dealt with or has his article kind of misrepresented a little of what was going on? No, I think his article didn't misrepresent it. It certainly ruffled the feathers of quite a few people here. And there was a lot of email traffic going around that day. I was actually doing a PhD vibe actually in Scotland, in St. Andrews, and trying to connect with a really crappy internet connection on the trains to try and keep on top of it was a lot of fun. But uh, there was a lot of consternation about that. Nottingham, well, basically, we have added, for the School of Physics and Astronomy at least, and I think this is true of other schools, we've added a specific statement in very straight terms that we will not accept this this qualification. And others I know have done the same in other universities. So, you know, his article helped immensely sort of for for making us um, aware of this. And I had a couple of email exchanges with him. It was also very well written, the piece. And again, there's another good example of how the style and the language and the way he presented it as a really good story and a really compelling story makes all the difference. Um, It's just what myself and Ziller, we had this little debate about those qualifications. I mean, I know, is there any merit to, like, we were arguing, well, the science kind of qualifications that you get there, they might be very questionable at best, but like stuff like the English and maths, would that... They'd yeah, be pretty no, no, sound, no, would they? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's absolutely fine. But the problem is we can't I agree that the you know the English and the other aspects it might be fine, but the problem is if we have somebody coming under the physics qualification that's you know, has a lot of awfully dodgy stuff in terms of, you know, connecting this with scripture, etc. And there were aspects of that. There's no way we can accept that. If you know if the science is wrong, we can't accept a physics qualification where the science is actually wrong. You're absolutely right. In other cases, you know, the English might well be fine. Maths may well be fine as well. But, you know, there may well be also connections with scripture in terms of, I don't know, spheres and pi and stuff. I, you know, difficult to know. I haven't seen it all in detail, but I have seen some of the um, aspects of the physics course. And there are, you know, really worrying things in there that just we couldn't accept somebody. And it wouldn't be fair for somebody to come in. The way we would do it is we have a foundation year. So this is for somebody with non-standard qualifications. So they do one year to prepare them to start on a degree course. So if somebody had done the ICCE, we're not going to reject them out of hand. Our advice would be come in on the foundation year course because it would also not be fair to bring one of those people in who are not sufficiently prepared, stick them on a first year course, take nine grand from them, which is the current fees in the UK, and then they get to the end and they fail. It just wouldn't be fair on them either. So if they come in through a foundation year, it should be fine. This is probably going to be off topic to maybe something more relevant at the start of the interview. But um, it's about communication to the media. I remember when I was in Copenhagen, one of the topics they brought up was communicating risk. And actually, one of the examples they actually mentioned, which I actually brought up in a previous segment, was the earthquake, the Italian earthquake, and how the seismologists were jailed. For from what I could tell, they didn't adequately explain the risk, and then I've associated with earthquakes uh, to the yeah. politicians because they were looking for a very bland yes or no. But with, earth, with earthquakes and other geological events, is a bit more grey. Yeah. How exactly can you communicate risk to just, a lay audience? Yeah, that, that Italian case is really worrying because, as you say, as well as communicating it to the politicians, the problem was there was also a radio interview, if I recall correctly, where there was a very definitive statement that, you know, don't worry about leaving because um, it, everything would be fine, that one of the scientists rather stupidly made. I think as scientists, we've always got to put across that everything is inherently uncertain. What I love to tell, and you've probably heard this as well, what I love to tell, the, you know, in your lectures, the first year undergraduates when they come in, is that if you have a measurement and you don't quote an error bar, the number you have is not even wrong. If I can sort of quote Powley, that was a <laughs> famous statement of Powley, because you can't compare it to anything. Yeah. If you don't know what the uncertainty is, you can't compare it. And one thing that's where this really plays, if I go off slightly off times and I'll come back in a second, one thing that's where this really worries me is Ofsted and how schools are monitored 
and the tables and the treatment of data where statistical fluctuations can be huge within an individual school and much bigger than the variation between schools. And yet that statistical fluctuation, that noise, is there's no health warning about that. It's just the raw figures are presented with no error bars. That's really, really worrying. And the argument that comes back, we actually met, myself and a couple of others met with some of the Ofsted statisticians. And their argument is that, well, government keeps telling us to simplify it. The data is too complicated. We need to simplify it. And when they simplify it, they pull out all this uncertainty. So as I say, it's not even wrong. And we as scientists have got to really withstand that and say, it doesn't matter if you want a simple message. It comes back almost to what I was saying about the videos before. It doesn't matter if you want a simple message. The complexity is important. The uncertainties are important. The error bars are important. Too often the scientist is seen as, you know, the repository of all known knowledge and wisdom, when in fact we should point out that, look, we've got a measurement, we've got a probability, we've got an uncertainty, and we've got to stress that uncertainty. It was like the... um the referendum scores, you know, now coming in 48 to 52 percent. Oh, they're in the lead. Well, no, it's neck and neck. The sampling error is probably of order three percent. So, you know, they're neck and neck. That's all you can say. You can't really say one side is beating the other. But that's not a story that sells well. So, yeah, that's actually something I notice. And when I'm demonstrating in undergrad labs is that that emphasis on trying to create a, a standard error. And in the reporting, it just isn't there until maybe fourth year, which I... Oh, really? But like, yeah, the labs I've done so far. That's, so those are chemistry labs? Those would be more bioprocess engineering, where the emphasis is more on trying to kind of get the basics of engineering down. Oh, okay. So in terms of, from your engineering perspective, what do you, error bars, I'd have thought were pretty important. Oh, yeah, we have to, I mean, we've got a pretty good grasp on errors because we're doing underwater marine electronics. So there's lots of factors in play. And like I said, we've got a big water test tank out at the back of our work and we can test our stuff out there. But when you dip it into the North Sea, it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just totally the like. I say. So we have to, we're always factoring in the errors much to our sales yeah. department's annoyance. Because they want to sell some hard figures too. Yeah, of course. And this is it. And also, again, in terms of simplifying messages, you don't want that uncertainty there. But yeah. we've got to dig our heels in. Because the problem as well, of course, is when you're selling, if we go back to the bloody papers and trying to get into those top drawer journals, or they'd like to think of themselves as top drawer journals. And often there's a lot of good stuff published in them. What you have to do is wash away the uncertainty. You've got to have a, a really compelling story. And that's how the paper reads. And, you know, there's no room for uncertainty there. It's like we've got this breakthrough. Wow. Look, our data completely supports this. And here's our story. Error bars are often, I would say, underplayed in those more newsworthy papers. I think the problem is uh, in science, you know, what we don't know is as important as what we do know. Precisely. Um, is what you've got to try and get across. And, was it Mark Twain who said, it's not what we don't know that's the problem, it's what we think we know that just ain't so. Exactly. And when we don't include these things like the error bars, then people get this false impression of what we know. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly And I had also noticed some pseudoscientists take that uncertainty, that language, and that, that uncertain language on scientists and use it to say, well, these people aren't really certain either. Yeah, Therefore, yeah. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But it's, so, it should be really emphasised in science reporting that this uncertainty is not to say that we we have no idea. It's it's a guess. It's a best idea. It, you know, there is this margin of error here, but it's very small or it's not completely miles and miles away. Yeah, it reminds me of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, so where the philosophers come in and they say, how how does it go? We want rigidly defined areas of doubt and uncertainty. Which is um pretty well. Pretty <laughs> yeah, because well. yeah, um well there's one very good example I saw about the errors thing and I was looking at um just DIY projects and it's people that build the old fashioned arcade cabinets. And the one the very first thing they said was don't use two different tape measures because they said they can often be like three centimeters out and you can end yeah. up your arcade cabinets could 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it's your yeah. marriage. So yeah, systematic and random errors. Yeah, they'll kill you every time. But that's the you know the message we try to get across to the first years is you know basically putting the error bar in is covering your arse. You know, it's <laughs> saying that you know look, you know if somebody else yeah. comes out and they have a different result from you, if you know if your error bar is such that you know that result is within where you did. The other thing of this, I know we're coming to the end here, but there's a very interesting example of of the sort of sociology of science and. If people have very fixed ideas of what a result should be, they will skew the results. So Millikan, who won the Nobel Prize, as you know, but in terms of his, he did this oil drop experiment. Where he's trying to measure the charge, the mass, well, ch- charging the electron. He took something like 170 different results. As he was going through, he was rejecting them left, right and center if they didn't come in close to the value that he wanted. And yet in the final paper, he said, you know, we used all 170 values. When you go back through his lab books, he'd rejected more than 100 of them. It's very interesting just in terms then of the psychology. If you look at how the value of the charge on the electron changed over the the subsequent years, as more and more people did the experiments, the first ones went, well, we can't be too far away from Millikan's result. And as it went on in time, you saw them get away from Millikan's result and converge on the actual result. But there was a long process of, well, the people that did it last got this. We can only go so far away from that, if you see what I mean, um, because they didn't want to be sort of proven wrong. They didn't want all their work to go down the toilet. Um, so, you know, we're as human. Scientists are as human as everybody else. Oh, but right. we are getting to an end, I think. Aren't yes. We? Yeah, we're just yeah. Ooh, I think we can start wrapping up there. So full of. There's anything else you want to get off your chest at the end here? No, that's been very cathartic. No, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I'll just go for the final thought, uh, Kitch. Uh, yeah, this has been very entertaining, very interesting. Uh, thank you for taking the time. Uh, 9 p.m. on a on a Saturday. On a Saturday. Well, the kids are in bed. That's, that's, so that's, <laughs> that's the important thing. The dog's trotting around somewhere, but the kids are in bed. So that's the important aspect. Okay, and Zilla? Yeah, no, it's been really great to talk to you. And as a an Arthur Conan Doyle fan, I'm just impressed that I've managed to speak to a Professor Moriarty. <laughs> Unfortunately, you're not a professor of mathematics, though. <laughs> All right, and yeah, I'll this... take what I can get. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, just a very big thank you, Phil, for taking the time out to speak to us tonight. Thank you. Great. And... Look forward to doing it again sometime. Oh yeah, well, always a pleasure to have you on, and. Uh, we don't know what segment's coming up as this is all pre-recorded, so enjoy the next segment, whatever it is. I'm sure it's going to be great, and we'll speak to you at the end of the show. Brilliant. Okay, see you later. Bye. Bye. Yes. Bye. Hi, everyone. Sorry about my voice. I have a mild case of the sniffles. Anyway, in my last segment, I explained what skepticism is and why it's important. Now it's time to start looking at how it actually works. I'm a constructivist, and uh, it's from that perspective that I will approach this issue. Constructivism is a theory of learning in which learning is regarded as a process of constructing mental models of reality. New information will be added to the existing model, and when we find that it simply doesn't fit in, we experience what's known as cognitive conflict. Either the new information is false, or the existing model is inaccurate. Resolving this conflict will involve modifying or possibly discarding entirely one of the two. What we end up with, assuming the new information isn't discarded, will be a new, slightly different model of reality that is more accurate than the old one. We've learned something. The important thing is to distinguish between reality and the mental model. When you think about a dog, there's no real dog in your mind, just a model, a representation of one. What a skeptic ultimately wants is for his mental models to be as accurate as possible. The method used to reach this goal, simply put, is to always demand that changes to a mental model be justified. That is, you should only change your mental models of real occurrences 
if you have good reason to believe that this will make the model more accurate. Obviously, the ultimate way to determine the accuracy of a model is to compare it against that which it represents. That's where science comes in, because that's what science is all about, making predictions based on existing models and testing these predictions to see if the real thing behaves like the model. Let me explain. Models have predictive power, just like a map. If this world map is accurate, then Canada is to the north of the United States. In other words, I can predict that if I go north from the United States, I'll end up in Canada. And I assume we all know that's true. But the point of models having predictive power is that they can also predict things about the unknown. A model that only predicts what is already known isn't really useful, except perhaps as a memory aid. My model of gravity, to use a very obvious example, doesn't say that it matters from where exactly on Earth an object is dropped. What matters is the mass of the object, its density, since it's not falling through a vacuum, and the distance to the Earth's center of mass. As such, I can predict that if I throw a rock out of my window, something I've never actually done, it will fall. Unless, of course, my model is incorrect. Now, granted, an inaccurate model can accidentally make correct predictions. A broken clock is right twice a day. But an accurate model will never make an incorrect prediction. Therefore, we can evaluate the accuracy of a model by looking at its ability to make demonstrably accurate predictions. If model 1 predicts A, B, and C, but not D, and model 2 predicts all four, and it turns out that they're all correct, then model 2 is more accurate than model 1 and should be adopted in its place. If model 2 only predicts A and B, then it's worse than model 1 and should be rejected. If it predicts A, B, and C, then it might not seem to matter which model we pick, but in that case, we're in a situation where the new model doesn't add anything new. It only predicts things we already knew, so there's no justification for adopting it. But hey, hang on. How is this skepticism? I'm just yapping on about mental models and predictions. What's all this about rejecting religion and debunking claims about the supernatural or conspiracy theories and all that stuff? Isn't a skeptic someone who just blindly accepts what mainstream science, media, and the big evil government tell him? And isn't he also necessarily an atheist? No, none of this is part of skepticism. Skepticism says nothing about what to think. It's entirely about how to think. The reason I reject the supernatural is simply that there is, to my knowledge, no justification for changing my mental model of reality into one that incorporates it. Demonstrate that such a model has greater accuracy than one that doesn't, and my skepticism will actually force me to accept that model. Let's take creationism, for example. It doesn't predict where new fossils with specific traits will be found. Evolutionary biology does, and the fact that such new fossils are found demonstrates that it's an accurate model. What prediction does creationism make? Well, first of all, since according to that model, the entire fossil record was the result of one catastrophic event, fossils should all be of similar age, and they should not be sorted by complexity at all. We should find things like rabbits and Precambrian strata, and we don't. It's because of things like this that the model fails, not because of some bias against miracles. The only bias in skepticism is in favor of models of reality that actually do what they're supposed to do. Describe reality. See you next time, and hopefully I won't have the sniffles then. Thank you for listening to Trolling with Logic. We hope you enjoyed the show this week. If you have enjoyed the show, do please consider going along to our Patreon and pledging some money to support us. It'll help cover our costs of editing and post-production. If you'd like to be considered for a future episode of Trolling with Logic, then send us a mail, contact at trollingwithlogic.com with a five-minute audio in WAV format and we'll consider you for inclusion on the show. Just five minutes talking about any skeptic-related subject you like. Any other general inquiries, then just send an email along to contact at or you can reach us through Twitter, Facebook, 
or in the YouTube comment section below. Thank you very much and we'll see you all very soon.